chapter 16, uh, we see uh, Sarah, we see Abram, we see Hagar, and the things that were just going to come to pass, this uh, working of the flesh and then the working of the spirit. And, and we know which way we want to go. Uh, we don't always go that way. It was certainly not Abraham's uh, desire to be working in the flesh, uh, but uh, we see that he, he also worked in the flesh at times, uh, as we all do, but uh, the forgiveness that was there, the hope that was there, uh, but certainly the promises of God that were there uh, that he didn't wait for, <laughs> just like you and I. We know God has promised us things. We know he has his promises in Scripture, and yet we don't always wait for them. We always sometimes move ahead of him and, and try and help him <laughs> with those promises just to get those to come to pass, but they aren't always good. Uh, so uh, it says in verse 1, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, gave him no children. She bare him no children. There was... Uh, just a, a time where the Lord had settled them in and put them in this place where uh, she wasn't going to bear children because the Lord wanted to bring that about uh, in, in such a way as to glorify himself, but also to get them to rest and have patience. Uh, <laughs> Sue was saying she was the one that had no patience. I, I don't think that's true because I think the rest of us are in their place. <laughs> we don't have patience. And we see Abraham not having patience, Sarah not having patience, uh, just trusting in the Lord in his promises. Uh, we see that uh, Abram's now around 86 years old, <laughs> uh, a wee bit old here, uh, but still not without God working in his life. And we think, well, we've hit this age and we can't do anything anymore we're too old for God to work through. We're, we're past our prime, if there was a prime. Uh, we're, we're past that, that place where God can really work and do something with us. But if he can work in a man that's 86, and we're going to see in the next chapter, he's now 99. <laughs> uh, and the Lord is still working. If he can work there, if we're still alive and still breathing, then the Lord can work. The Lord can do an awesome work in our lives no matter what our age. It doesn't matter our age. What matters is our heart. Is our heart open to let the Lord work? Uh, and uh, we, we see that uh, because of the age, because of their condition, that they thought they were past their prime, they thought that God couldn't work because they were too old. And how sad that is, because uh, we've got a whole generation that just has settled into that place. Well, uh, we're, we're too old, we're retired, we'll just settle down and not do anything. And boy, how sad that is. Uh, instead of being an example for the younger ones uh, of trusting God and his promises, we're in a place where we, we don't believe those promises are for us anymore. Uh, and we see that with Sarah and Abram. Uh, and so she said, it says that she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, probably from the time that they went down a couple chapters before to Egypt. They probably picked up this, this handmaid, this, this woman who was going to become uh, uh, just in the family, but uh, <laughs> going to be kicked out of the family, as we'll see later on. But she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, that it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. <laughs> Not always a good thing to listen. We, we know the promises of God. We know the truths of God. And when they go against Scripture, we really need to come to that place of saying, Uh-uh. <laughs> it, 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 it's time to say no and it's hard sometimes to say no especially when our flesh rises up and says yeah I, I need to enter into that place now of, of doing that um, and what a what a sad thing that is when we dismiss God and don't believe his word and come into a place of doing that uh, so Sarai says to Abram uh, the Lord has restrained me which is partially true uh, but not completely true because he is going to use her and he is going to use her to have a child. Because remember, the Lord has told them that, that a child was going to come from their loins. And so uh, we see that they're just not going to trust the promises. They're going to help God out. I know none of you ever do that. 
<laughs> I do it, and it never works well, does it? it? It always comes to a place where we end up in trouble because we're trusting ourselves more than we're trusting him. And his ways are always better than our ways. We may not think so, but uh, they always are. He says, uh, go into my maid that it may be that I may obtain children by her. She'll, she'll be a surrogate mother for me. And Abram hearkened to the voice of, of Sarai. Instead of trusting the Lord, he trusts now the voice of reason, this logical reasoning that man has come up with rather than God's promises. And, and we can't reason our way through things to come against the word of God. We have to be in that place where we stay true to the word of God and not do those things that, that are going to bring us destruction in our downfall. And that's really all it, that it does, is bring that into their lives. So Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. And I love the way the Holy Spirit keeps bringing that out. She's her maid. She's an Egyptian. And what does Egypt represent in Scripture for us but the ways of the world? I'm bringing you the world. I'm bringing you the ways of the world. And I want you, Abram, to come into that place of walking in the ways of the world rather than the, in the ways of promise. And Abraham does it. He obeys the wife, his wife that has brought this to pass. So she took her maid, the Egyptian. And after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, he gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Uh, so they, they enter into this polygamous, polygamous, polygamous relationship, the, this place where he was going to have more than one wife. And we see that still going on in the world today, still in America today, where there's places that they do that. Uh, but God never said that. He has always said one man, one woman together in marriage. And so for Abraham to go against this it is really for him to enter into a place of walking in sin that he's going to need to repent of later. And the results, the consequences are going to come back to haunt him. But just imagine, he's here now 10 years in Canaan. The Lord has promised him that he's going to have a child in the land. And, and they've come to the land. They're there 10 years now. Can you imagine the day after day of thinking, is today going to be the day? Is today going to be the day where she becomes pregnant and has a child? The day after day routine of just walking in the place of trying to trust the promises of God. <laughs> but we do, don't we? And we see much of the church having struggles with that same thing because God has promised that he's going to come back and get his church and rapture us out of here. And we keep looking at the news going, Lord, today, <laughs> today would be a great day. We, we see whole church movements fall apart at the promises of God. And now we have much of the church saying that God isn't going to fulfill that. The rapture of the church was just something that was made up by man, and it's not true. It's not real. How much of the Bible do you have to dismiss to do that? And what are you going to read and say, this is of God and this isn't of God? My Bible says that every word is inspired of God and given by God. And it's for us to believe, to trust, and to hold on to. And if we don't do that, we're going to suffer the consequences of it. We see one of the Christian colleges in upstate New York uh, who now have dismissed some people from their employment because they wouldn't use the right pronouns. And it just, it just grieves my heart to see that their name is a Christian college, and yet they don't believe the Word of God. They're not trusting the Word of God. They're going to a whole new level. And you go, whoop, cross that one off from my list of colleges to go to. Just, oh, how sad that we keep coming to these places of not trusting God. Keep your focus, keep your heart in that right place of just trusting the Lord for the things that are going to be there. So it says in verse 4 that he then went into Hagar, the, this woman who is a bondwoman, who is a slave, uh, just like we saw in our responsive reading, uh, that she was going to have this uh, child, uh, but she was going to be the bondwoman, and there was going to be whole people groups that would come out after her uh, through her loins that, that were going to be in that place of just being a thorn in Israel's flesh because the people groups that would come through it through Ishmael were going to be the groups that now attack Israel constantly and are a thorn in their flesh. They surround Israel. Just the last couple of weeks, over 800 rockets fired into Israel. 
<laughs> Lebanon poised at the border with thousands of rockets just pointed at Israel. Nowhere else, just Israel. This little country, bigger, no bigger than Rhode Island, <laughs> just a, a little place, and yet the whole world hates it. Censured more by the UN than any other nation in the world. Can you imagine we got nations that are killing people constantly that aren't getting censured at all? Israel takes a little piece of land and they censure it for taking the land. Really. And you wonder why. It's a spiritual battle that's going on. And it's a spiritual battle for you and I to hang on to the Word of God. <laughs> we face it every single day. And you go, Lord, I'm tired. And he goes, I know, but I'm going to be your strength. So hang on to me. Hang on to my promises. Hang on to my truths. And walk through today knowing that I'm going to get you through today. And I'm going to bring you into tomorrow. We trust him in the midst of that. But Abram didn't do it. And we see the results of it. And we go, oh, Lord, don't let me do that. And yet, how often do we do it? <laughs> we get up in the morning, we read the word, and we go, Lord, this is great, this is wonderful, I'm not going to do that today, I'm going to walk with you all day long. You're going to be my God, you're going to be my Savior, I'm going to pray to you all day long. And what happens? You get in your car and you instantly lose your salvation. <laughs> the first car you meet just cuts you right off, and they get mad at you because you got in their way. <sighs> and we lose it, don't we? Lord, help. If it wasn't for God's grace, where do you think we would be? I know where I would be. I'd be dead by now. But His grace and His mercy, He saves us. And He gives us real life. So let's trust Him. Let, and, and these are written for our admonition. These are written to be our examples. And, and these are things that we hold on to and we look at and we go, Okay, Lord, uh, I, I know that's true. I know it's real. I know my heart needs to be changed. So it, it says that He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So she comes to that place uh, of having child in her, and she despises Sarah. Oh. And, and we see the consequences of, of entering into a relationship that wasn't supposed to be. And Sarah, I said unto Abram, my wrong be upon you. I have given my maid into your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was, <coughs> excuse me. I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. <laughs> My Bible tells me that we're supposed to dwell with our wives according to wisdom, according to knowledge. It's kind of hard to figure that out sometimes, isn't it? She's the one that pushes it. He does it. And then she goes, you're bad. <laughs> I was just doing what you told me to do. It was wrong. <laughs> That's why... We need to be walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because mm. look at the troubles that it causes between husband and wife. Even though one pushed it, the other one should have said no. Abram should have said no. He knew the word enough to know that this was wrong. And yet he did it anyway. To suffer the consequences, not only with Ishmael being born and being a thorn in Israel's flesh, but now he has to deal with a wife that says, you did wrong. What's the matter with you? <laughs> He goes, what do you say? <laughs> you go and repent and turn. Um, <laughs> uh, I was despised in her eyes, so judge between me and thee. And you know what he's going to say. Honey, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you know I'm for you. But Abraham said unto Sarai, I behold, your maid is in your hand to do to her as it pleases you. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. She was harsh with her. Uh, she, she was uh, jealous of her. She moved against her. Uh, and so Hagar flees from the face of, of Sarai and, and runs away. But notice the grace of the Lord. It doesn't say this woman was saved. It doesn't say anything about that. But he meets with her. And that is so gracious, knowing that out of her loins is going to come this man who's going to be a thorn in Israel's flesh. And yet knowing all of that still comes and meets with her. And that's the grace of God, that even though we're in sin, even though we don't have a relationship, he's going to come and meet with her. And it says the angel of the Lord and, and mark that in your Bibles, the angel of the Lord. It doesn't say an angel of the Lord. It says the angel of the Lord. 
And when it speaks of that in the Old Testament, more often than not, it means that this was a pre-incarnate appearing of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself comes to meet with this woman who's not a believer, who's walking in the flesh, and yet Jesus comes to meet with her and to speak with her. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by a fountain on the way to Shur. So Jesus comes, he meets with her, and notice he meets with her by a fountain of water, by a place that was supposed to be a place of refreshment, a place of strengthening, a, a place w where you could go and just be able to relax and, and just enjoy and get refreshed and strengthened up and build up. Uh, and just in that place, and notice she's in the wilderness. So to have a fountain in the wilderness is just a blessing. She finds this fountain. She wants to be refreshed. She wants to be strengthened. Uh, and the Lord meets with her there. Uh, and yet he's going to give her something hard to do. And sometimes when the Lord does the greatest refreshing in our lives, is a place where also he's going to tell us that things are going to be hard and that he wants us to do something that's hard to our flesh, but easy for him to accomplish in and through us. I want you to walk with me today. Well, Lord, this is going to be a hard day. I can't do that. You can if you let me work in your life and through your life. Here, I'll give you some refreshment. I'll strengthen you, and I'll give this for you to do. And she has a choice to make. Notice he doesn't say you have to do it. He says, I want you to do this. Isn't that just like the Lord? that he never tells us we have to do it. He tells us we can do it, but if we don't do it, we're going to suffer the consequences of it. There's a fountain of water, a place of refreshment, but he's going to give her something to do. And it says in verse 8 that he said, Hagar, he calls her by name, speaks to her by name. If that was me, I'd go, how do you know my name? Who are you anyway? <laughs> but she doesn't say that. She just acknowledges that, that he has something over her that, that that's amazing. Hagar, Sarai's maid. Notice he calls her Sarai's maid. You're supposed to be a maid. This is the, the duty that you have. This is what you were uh, uh, conscripted to do. So why aren't you doing what you were supposed to do? And notice he's not yelling at her. He's just saying, why aren't you doing what you were supposed to be doing? He calls us by name. Says, why aren't you doing what you were supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be a good husband. You're supposed to be a good wife. You're supposed to be a good father. You're supposed to be a good example at work. Why aren't you doing it? As he meets with us at a place of refreshing. He's not throwing out fire and brimstone at her. He's just meeting with her and giving her a place of refreshment so that she could just sit down and get encouraged and going the right way. And the Lord does that with you and I as we go the wrong way sometimes and he meets with us and he says, why are you going that way? And we go, because it looks like the best way for me to go. And he goes, no, it's, it's going to be the wrong way. This is a better way. Let me show you the way you need to go. And we have that choice to make. Will I do it today or will I not do it today? Ooh. Always a choice because he doesn't force us. God will never force you to do anything. The enemy will force you. But God will never force you to do it. So he asks her two questions. He says, where, where have you come from and where are you going to go? You're running away, but you have no idea where you're going to go. You're running away from God at times. Where are you going to go? Remember in, in John chapter 6, uh, Peter looks at him and says, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. You're the only one that does. Where are we going to go from your presence? Because remember, 70 others who had come walked away from Jesus because he gave them a hard thing. There was going to be a hard thing that was coming. And Peter says, Lord, where else are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Only you and you alone. It doesn't matter if it's going to be hard. If he's in the midst of it, it's okay. And there are hard things we have to do. We have to die to self if we're going to walk with the Lord. Because there can't be two masters. <laughs> and he's the only master that we need. Uh, it tells us this in, in Hosea uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 14. 
Uh, it says, therefore, behold, I, I will allure her. I, I will call her and bring her into the wilderness. As the Lord speaks to, to Hosea about what he's going to do with Israel, I'm going to allure her and bring her into the wilderness, the same place that we are with Hagar, into the wilderness. But I'm going to speak comfortably with her and encourage her to go in the right direction. Again, the same thing that's going on here with Abraham. There's nothing new under the sun. As he calls us and says, just come and sit with me for a minute and read my word. And I'll speak comfortably to you. And I'll show you the things that are in front of you and the things that you're going to be facing. This, this time of testing, this time of, of questioning. Where are you going to go, Hagar? <laughs> it tells us this in Psalm 31, uh, verse 22. Uh, it says, For I said in my haste, I am cut off before their eyes. I am cut off before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest my voice of my supplications when I cried unto you. For you and I, as we cry out to the Lord, he listens and he hears. As Wade said before, he hears our cries. He listens when we call. But here's this woman. She's in this place. She's in the wilderness. She's near a fountain. She's uh, having to make this decision. And it's interesting. On the, on the way to Shur, the word Shur means wall or door. She's at a place where she's kind of hemmed in. And there can be an opening to go a different direction. But there's also there a wall or a door shut so that she would go back in the right direction. And the Lord doesn't command her that she has to go the right direction, but to encourage her to go the right direction. I'll put something in your way so that you need to stop and consider, so that you stop and need to, need to hear what, what's really going on. So he asked her two questions. Where have you come from and where are you going to go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. She only gives one answer. <laughs> in other words, I'm here because of my mistress, Sarai, but I have no clue on where I'm going. And we did that when we got saved, didn't we? <laughs> As the Lord looked at us and, and, and he says, where are you going? And we go, I, I really have no idea. Because we had no clue what was going on, did we? <laughs> we had no clue where we were going. We, we thought we had a plan. We thought we had a five-year plan. But it got interrupted because we started aging. <laughs> it got interrupted because we got diseases. It, it got interrupted because all of a sudden time flew by and all of a sudden we're this age and we had no idea how we got here. Yesterday I was just 20 and look at me now. <laughs> just how did I get here so quick? But the word says that life is like a vapor, isn't it? It goes so quick and it does go so quick. But he says, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go from here? And Lord, help me today to go from here to a place of refreshing where I could just be in your word, get refreshed by you, get strengthened up. Because, Lord, you've given me today and I need strength to go through today. Frank wasn't planning on going to the hospital yesterday and having surgery, <laughs> but that's where he ended up. We don't have a plan today to go out from here and have an accident, but we might. And you know what? Every single day somebody dies. Where are they going to go? And where are we going to go? Oh, Lord, help us to make sure of our calling and election. So the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself unto her hands. What's he asking her to do? Not just go back to Sarah, but submit to her. I want you to go back to your, to your mistress and submit your life to her. I want you to go back to your husband and submit to him. I want you to go back to your wife and submit to her. I want you to come back to that relationship with me and submit yourself to me so that you can have real life. Oh, that's a hard thing you're asking me, Lord. But isn't it great that he prepares her for it by giving her a place where there's refreshment so that she can get strengthened up and make a right decision in a right way? Remember the woman at the well? Because Jesus meets her at the well. Seems like Jesus was around water a lot. Maybe it's because he's the living water. I don't know. <laughs> and, and, and she says, how are you going to get water out of the well? You've got no bucket. He goes, oh, I got water that you don't even know about. Let me pour it into you. Oh, And doesn't he want to do that with you and I? When we're in a place of indecision, when we're in a place of hurting, and we're not making right decisions, we're just crying and, and we're despondent, we're in despair. And he says, let me refresh you. 
and strengthen you so, so that you can make a right decision, so that you can go the right way. And that's just so sweet. We can get through anything as long as we have our God with us and we trust him. We can get through anything. Return to your mistress. Return. What does he say to the church at Ephesus in Revelation? Return to your first love. What was their first love? Walking with Jesus and trusting him. Where did they come to? A place of walking away from him. Within 30 years when the church was found to the book of Revelation, they walked with the Lord and in 30 years they walked away. And if that whole church where they're all knit together in, in one place with the Lord, if they can walk away in 30 years, what can you and I do in one day? Can we walk away from the Lord? Sure, doesn't mean that we're not saved, but boy, what a life to live without walking with Christ in it. In the way the world is right now, I don't want to go through another day without walking with Jesus. I want to walk with him because he knows the only way for me to get through this mess that the world has made. And I want to do it rightly. <laughs> but isn't it merciful, too, that he stops her from going the wrong direction and encourages her to go in the right direction? Again, not forcing her, but encouraging her, but putting a stop to the way that she was going so that she could go back and go in the right direction. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply your seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. She was going to have a multitude of people, too. Trouble is, they're going to go the wrong direction. But she was the bondwoman who was going to have a multitude that were going in the wrong direction. But Sarah was going to be the, the woman of promise. Through Sarah's womb was going to come a son of promise. It wasn't through Hagar. God had never made that promise for her. He had made it for Abraham and Sarah. And sometimes we look at, at the promises that people get in their lives and we go, how come, Lord, you gave them that promise and I don't have the same promise? <laughs> it's because we're not them. We're different people and he's given us different promises. We all certainly have that same promise that we're going to, if we're saved, we're going to heaven. And if we're not saved, we're, we're going to end up in the other place. Yeah. Those are promises that are going to come to pass. But sometimes he gives people promises that, that I will never see, that I'll never have. He gives gifts to you that I don't have. And, and those are promises from him that he'll use those things in your life to encourage you and strengthen you and how to walk and, and how to be. And the things that you're going to face are going to be encouraged by those gifts that he gives you. He gives her a gift of being able to go back and submit her life into somebody that she didn't like. And when she, was de she despised Sarah because she got a gift from Abraham that Sarah didn't have. And she thought, ah, I'm better than she is. But she had to go back into a place of realizing I'm not better, I'm just different. And it's okay if we don't all have the same gifts. But what's necessary is that we use what he's given us for his glory. And it's good for us to do that. And so the angel of the Lord in verse 11 says unto her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you're going to call his name uh, Ishmael, which means God shall hear. Great name for a kid, isn't it? Oh, just because he has a great name doesn't mean he's going to turn out well, though, does it? <laughs> oh, you're going to bear a son, and his name is going to be Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your, thy affliction. The Lord has heard your cry. She's in this place where she hasn't called on God, did she? She wasn't looking for God. She was looking for a way of escape from the pain of the world. She wasn't looking for God. She wasn't crying out to God. And yet God heard her and met with her even though she wasn't. And we think, well, we've got to go through this whole ritual of things before God's really going to hear us. <laughs> That's not true. God hears the cry of people. From their hearts and knows how to minister to each and every heart in each and every way you don't have to go through a ritual for god to hear you he just needs a heart that's willing to cry out and sometimes we don't even know who we're crying out to <laughs> lord i'm crying out i i have no idea what's going on how and he meets with us and shows us the way to go he's not ashamed to meet with us he, he's not saying, well, you haven't done steps A, B, C, and D to get to me, so therefore you can't. Anybody that's willing to call on the name of the Lord, he's going to meet with, and he's going to minister to. 
and he's able to meet every single need. She had a need that she couldn't get taken care of, but she met with the God who could take care of the need. And that's what we need to do. That's the place that we need to be. But he says this, he's going to be a wild man. On second thought, Lord, (laughs) maybe take this child away, because I don't really need another wild child. Uh, uh, We got enough of them out there, don't we? Oh, my goodness. He will be a wild man. His hand is going to be against every man. He He's telling her what's going to go on with her child. Isn't that amazing? She's just found out she got pregnant, and he's already telling her, this kid is going to be wild, and he's going to be against everybody. Guess what that means? He's also going to be against you, Hagar. Oh, Because if he's against everybody, that includes her. Oh, That's a hard one to bring up, isn't it? And every man's hand is going to be against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. He's going to be there, uh, and they're all going to see that. And, And so she called the name of the Lord that spoke unto her, Thou God that seest me. <laughs> For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? As she asked that question, I wasn't even looking for you, Lord. And yet she sees him and she goes, this is the place where God saw me. And what she's really doing is marking a place that God had met with her. And we do that too, don't we? When God meets with us, we kind of mark that as a a revelation in our life, a, a time where God has met with us and saved us. A time where God met with us and gave us a promise. A time that God met with us and opened up the scriptures like he never did before with us. And we mark those times and we look at those times and we rejoice in those times. And that's what she's doing. And I know commentators are very divided over whether she was really saved or or not. I don't know. But what I know is I'm going to look for her when we're there. And if I see her, I'm going to rejoice. Because God can save the the most ungodly person. And if he can save them, what can he do with you and I? He can save us. (laughs) And she called the name of the Lord that spoke with her, Thou God that seest me. For she has said, Have I also here looked after him that sees me? Wherefore the well was called Ber Lahai Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and... Uh, in Bered. So the name of Ber Lahai Roy uh, is the well of him that, that liveth and seeth me. He's alive. And uh, if you got the King James, it's the ETH. <laughs> it's ongoing. Uh, it's still the same. God still lives and he still sees us. But notice where it is. It's between Kadesh and Bered. Kadesh means sanctuary and Bered means hail, almost a storm like presence. She's, as we would say, between a rock and a hard place. (laughs) She's between something that's good, something that's hard. She's in that place of, I have a decision to make of which direction I'm going to go. Which place am I going to go to? Am I going to go to a place of sanctuary where God walks with me and keeps me? Or am I going to go through a storm and go my own direction? And that's what we do. We kind of make our own storms in life sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> we we enter into those places where, where we just want to go our direction no matter what God says, and we're going to go there. And he says, there's a storm there. And we go, that's all right. It looks better to me right now than it does here. There might, who knows, there might be a rainbow in that storm, Lord. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, but you still got to go through the storm to get there. Wouldn't you rather just have a place of sanctuary where the storm wouldn't be? And Hagar bare Abram a son. And Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. He was 86 years old when she bare that son, this bondwoman who was going to enter into the place of just being prominent in Scripture. But the offspring was going to be a place that was not the place of promise. And sometimes religiously we come to that place because it tells us in Galatians as we go through and we, we read part of it this morning uh, that, that she was the son of, he was the son of the bondwoman, uh, but Sarah was, was the, the woman who was going to bear a son who was going to be of the free woman. She was free. She wasn't under bondage. And many want to come into that place of bondage, which it talks about is in Jerusalem, but it's in a place of bondage. 
they're in a place of sanctuary, but there's no freedom because they're under the law. Because it said Hagar was of Sinai. And what was Sinai in Scripture? The place where the Ten Commandments were given. The place where the law was given. And many come to that place of wanting to walk in the law to get pleasure in it and, and to be pleasing unto the Lord because they keep every part of the law. I hate to tell you, but you can't even keep one commandment, much less ten. <laughs> and now if you're in Israel, they, they bumped it up a little bit. There's 613 laws that you got to keep every single day of your life. Oh, I know what I'd do. I'd rip up the first 500. <laughs> the other 113 I'd just give up on soon. And pretty soon I wouldn't keep any of them because you and I can't keep the law. In this natural man, we can't keep the law. We won't keep the law. And thank goodness for grace. The grace of the Lord, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, Scripture tells us, lest any man would boast. If we can keep the law, we're going to boast about it. Look at how good I am. Remember the Pharisee and the publican? <laughs> the Pharisee comes and he says, thank goodness I'm not like this fair, like this publican. I, I'm above that. I, I'm a keeper of the law. And the publican came and just humbled himself and just beat his chest and said, forgive me. And grace met the publican. And law meets the Pharisee that says, I can keep this. I can do this. We can't. I can't get enough righteousness to get my way into heaven because I'm a sinner. And I need salvation, and I can't save myself, but thank goodness Jesus came to save us. And that's what we're going to celebrate this morning, is just that, that place of, of being there where we realize by grace Jesus has saved us, that place that the Lord has met with us, uh, and that we can celebrate that today, that, that we can come to a place of just knowing Him in the midst of it. And, and so if there, you... You've come to that place and you're just realizing that you've walked away from grace and you're starting to enter back into a, a place of legalism, a place of trying to, to walk and to please God by, by works. Uh, just let it go this morning and, and just be set free because he wants to set you free from that. And so, Father, we just come this morning and we, we ask, Lord, that you just minister to our hearts as we prepare our hearts to take communion, as we realize, Lord, that... that the son of the bondwoman will never be free. We can only be free is it, it, when we're in Christ. And so, Father, have your way with our hearts this morning. Have your way with who we are that we might just be settled before you and just know where we are with you, Lord. That if there's anything going on in our lives where we're really just pushing ourselves to be something in, in Christ, that we could just let it go and, and let him work in us. If we're between a... a a, a wall, uh, a hard place, a storm, and a sanctuary. Lord, help us to enter into the sanctuary where you, you would just pour out your grace and mercy upon us. Be with us, Lord. Those decisions that we have to make, Father, if we've run away from something and you're calling us to return, uh, Father, please just minister to us in that place. But help us to return to that first love. We thank you, Lord, and we just rejoice in who you are and just... Settle our hearts now, Father, that we might hear from you and just know that you're speaking to us. And we just rejoice in you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.